from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm reading the classical and Christian origins of American politics, political theology, natural law, and the American founding by Cody Cooper and Justin Dyer. In chapter 7, The Law of Nature and James Wilson's Lectures on Law. Scholars of the U.S. founding have come to, quote, recognize religiosity as central to any plausible account of the intellectual origins of the American Revolution, end quote. The precise character of the religiosity is contested, however, and there is an ongoing interpretive, interpretive debate about whether the intellectual frame of the U.S. founding was one of the privileged Christianity. Um, the, so the precise character of that religiosity is contested, however, and there is an ongoing interpretive debate about whether the intellectual frame of the U.S. founding was one that privileged Christianity or deism, or perhaps even some hybrid between the two. Looming large over the scholarly dispute, as we have seen, is the question of 18th century Christianity's relationship to natural theology, a, ra a rational investigation of God's existence and attributes apart from divine revelation. Natural theology's distinction between truths known by reason, independent of revelation, and truths known only by revelation, was common enough in the founding era that the Presbyterian clergyman John Witherspoon, president of the College of New Jersey and signer of the Declaration of Independence, began his lectures on moral philosophy by defining the subject as, quote, an inquiry into nature and grounds of moral obligation by reason as, as distinct from revelation, end quote. Thomas West rightly notes that the founding era distinction between reason and revelation, quote, does not necessarily imply a conflict, end quote, Yet many scholars disagree and see that this and see the two traditions of biblical and natural theology as as contradictory and mutually exclusive. To the extent that the revolutionary era clergy and statesmen were appealing to truths known by reason, they were, according to some prominent interpretations of the U.S. founding, abandoning the theology, the, the, the theological, you know, the theological tenets of Christianity. Michael Zuckert go so far as to suggest that the Bible and the Declaration offer discordant and mutually exclusive, quote, narratives of the nature and destiny of humanity, end quote. By eschewing reliance on biblical revelation, Zuckert contends, the Declaration and the liberal tradition, it represents a uh, raise reason to a place of primacy over revelation and asserts reasons, self-sufficiency in moral and political philosophy. Following the 20th century, Swiss Reformed theologian Karl Barth's wholesale rejection of natural theology. Some Reformed theologians in the 20th century also viewed natural theology as it, and, and its cognate, um, the cognate concepts of natural law and natural rights as inconsistent with Christianity's commitment to divine revelation in Scripture. Beginning with the premise that Christianity is incompatible with claims rooted in natural theology and natural law, scholars and theologians from various camps have thus concluded that the prevalent idiomatic appeals to nature, e.g., law of nature, nature, um, law of nature, natural rights, nature's God, moral sense, and related concepts, among the U.S. founders marks a significant shift away from Christianity and towards an Enlightenment era natural theology that is hostile to Christianity's uh, historic theological commitments. The pro the prominence of the Christian natural law tradition is founding in founding era political thought cuts against these interpretations. Natural law theorists have historically held that there is a purposeful created order in nature, including human nature, and that God providentially directs human beings to their proper ends through the faculty of reason. The common emphasis in natural law theory on, on God, both as a creator of a purposeful order in nature and as the providential author of a natural moral law known to reason, predates Christianity. But Christians have nonetheless historically affirmed the rational intelligibility and the intelligibility of created moral order, and uh, that is epistemically independent of revelation. To speak of the Christian natural law tradition, then, is to speak of the long Christian engagement with a philosophic tradition that understands human goods and moral norms to be based on a distinctive order of nature created by God and intelligible to human reason. 
Although some 20th century Protestant theologians did reject the claim of the natural law tradition on, on epistemological grounds, following human reason being as seen uh, being seen as radically defective and unreliable, uh, we should not mistakenly equate the modern epistemological rejection of natural law and natural rights with the broader Protestant Christian tradition, stretching back to the 16th century, as John T. McNeil noted in an article published during the period of Barth's ascendancy, saying, there, there, is no real there is no real discontinuity between the teaching of the Reformers and that of their predecessors with respect to natural law. The assumption of some contemporary theologians that natural law has no place in the company of Reformation theology cannot be allowed to govern historical inquiry or to, or to lead us to ignorance, minimize, or evacuate of reality the positive utterances on natural law scattered throughout the works of the reformers. A growing body of revisionist scholarship has built on McNeil's work to demonstrate that the natural law tradition associated primarily with Roman Catholicism today remained unbroken in the theology of the, re of the early uh, reformers and their successors. Political theorists have uh, not fully integrated recent insights about the historical continuity of the natural law tradition in Protestant and particularly reformed theological ethics into interpretations of American political thought. There is a need for subtle reinterpretations of the, of the theological ideas of those who made significant contributions to the movement for independence and the creation of the new political institutions in the Young Republic. The Pennsylvania delegate to the Constitutional Convention and early Supreme Court Justice James Wilson is a case in point. Prevailing, a prevailing scholarship, uh, prevailing scholarly interpretations, cast his lectures on law, 1790 through 1791, at the College of Philadelphia as paradigmatic of the founding eras, allegedly rationalistic heterodox natural theology. Yet Wilson's lectures point in quite the opposite direction to a vision of the founding era jurisprudence that was self-consciously rooted in a divinely created and rationally intelligible moral order that was both complemented and presupposed by Christian revelation. So understood Wilson's lectures bring into focus the limitations of the common scholarly conventions and categories that contrast enlightenment and religion, reason and revelation, or nature's God and the God of Abraham. In Wilson's lectures, there, these are not, quote, either or, end quote, categories, but are rather presented together in a synthesis that emerged from the long Christian engagement with the natural law tradition. The Contested Legacy of Jane Wilson's Lectures on Law The Contested Legacy of James Wilson's Lectures on Law By any, me uh, by any measure, James Wilson had and or an outsized influence on the American founding. A Scottish immigre who was one of the only six men to sign both the Declaration of Independence and the, and the U.S. Constitution, uh, Wilson went on to play a major role in the ratification debates in Pennsylvania and to serve on the United States Supreme Court as an associate justice from 1789 until his death in 1798. As a sitting member of the first Supreme Court, uh, Wilson was invited by the College of Philadelphia to present a series of lectures on the foundations of law of U.S. law. According to a contemporaneous article published in a Pennsylvania newspaper, at the audience for the first, le uh, for the first lecture, delivered December 15, 1790, included, quote, the President of the United States with his lady, also the Vice President and both Houses of Congress and President and both Houses of the Legislature of Pennsylvania, together with a great number of ladies and gentlemen, end quote. After the initial lecture, Wilson taught 15 students for whom he delivered a total of 58 lectures, which were edited and published posthumously by his son, Bird Wilson, in 1804. Wilson aspired to be an American Blackstone, and he hoped his lectures would occupy a central place in U.S. legal education, as had, as had Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England during the colonial era. Uh, era. The lectures are quite consciously studying the foundations of law and address, a broad, uh, address broad questions of moral, political, and legal philosophy. Because of his influence in the founding era and his systematic approach to philosophy, 
Wilson's lectures on law are a, are a valuable window into early American jurisprudence. Significantly, the lectures deal with the first principles rather than legal precedent, and they present a vision of law that, quote, is not the secularized natural law of some 18th century rationalist, end quote. Indeed, quote, throughout his work, and particularly in his law lectures, Wilson clearly, consistently, and systematically appealed to the Christian natural law tradition, end quote. Some revisionist scholarship, however, contests this interpretation of Wilson's as a representative of, a, of the Christian natural law tradition in the spirit of modern republicanism, political theorist Thomas Pangle discards uh, the conventional view that, quote, the thought of the founders must be viewed as a continuation of Christian and especially Calvinist thinking, end quote, and proactively suggests through a series of leading questions of some of the most influential founders, quote, Franklin, Madison, Jefferson, Wilson, and Hamilton, end quote, were engaged in a project, quote, to exploit and transform Christianity in the direction of a liberal rationalism, end quote. Other prominent scholars have brought similar philosophic assumptions to their study of the American founding, and perhaps the starkest ju 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 juxtaposition, the natural philosophy of the Enlightenment, including not only its natural theology, but its theory and natural justice and natural rights, is portrayed as necessarily subversive to over of Orthodox Christianity's commitment to divine revelation, which is a great impediment to Lockean liberalism. I read in this light, I read in this light, then Wilson's teachings and his lectures become subtly subversive of Christianity. The various efforts to categorize James Wilson's religion, in quote, as a yeah, quote, the various efforts to categorize James Wilson's religion, in quote, Greg Fraser contends along these same lines, quote, epitomize the need for the label theistic rationalist, in quote. The theistic rationalist, according to Fraser, is one of who uh, elevates reason first to make it equal to revelation and then next to make it the judge of revelation. As Thomas Aquinas taught, philosophy was the handmaiden of theology, so the theistic rationalist reverses that priority and makes theology the handmaiden of philosophy. Wilson and Fraser notes taught that, quote, reason and conscience can do much, but still they stand in need of support and assistance from revelation, end quote. This is significant, according to Fraser, because, quote, scripture was called upon by Wilson to support and assist reason, not to not the reverse. For him, the scriptures support, confirm, and corroborate, but do not supersede the operation of reason and the moral sense. That is the theistic rationalist position, end quote. Wilson's assertion that the scriptures do not supersede the operations of reason and the moral sense is not tantamount to an assertion that reason and the moral sense are ever in conflict with revelation. However, Wilson is explicit that the, quote, law of nature and the law of the revelation are both divine. They flow uh, through in different channels from the same adorable source. It is indeed preposterous to separate them from each other, end quote. According to Wilson, scripture presupposes knowledge of the moral law of nature, which consists of intuitive truths known to the moral sense and reasons, deductions, that reasons deductions from those intuitive truths. Based on his framing assumption, Fraser mistakenly attributes to Wilson a subversive ele elevation of reason over revelation. Bangles errs in a different direction, homing in on Wilson's emphasis on conscience as a moral sense attributing to Wilson a kind of hobbyist elevation of, of passion over reason. Although reason has a role in correcting the moral sense and judging matters of fact, Pangolin maintains in his interpretation of Wilson the, quote, ultimate ends of first principles are self-evident, but to sentiment, to feeling, rather than to reason, end quote. And, quote, the closer look at Wilson's lectures on law tells a different story and demonstrates Wilson's continuity with those traditions that he allegedly subverted. Wilson insisted, insisted that reason, revelation, and the moral sense are in harmony. As early scholarship on Wilson noted, his understanding of reason and revelation had more in common with classical Christian sources than it did with the teachings of modern rationalists. And Wilson's discussions of law, quote, displayed his, in his indebtedness to this scholastic and Jelligan tradition of Aquinas and Hooker, end quote, even as he wedded the classical tradition to the epistemological insights of the common sense school of Thomas Reed. And he goes on to talk about wisdom or the law of nature.
Can't stop it. Then fire some Holy Spirit. Amen.